too many. Which one? Tell me which one. That one. The, the middle right. mill. Right. Middle mill. We, we spent the whole 20 minutes deciding what the seating arrangement was going to be. Yeah. And I, I, first of all, I want to thank so many people for waking up early in the morning and coming to a nine o'clock session. Uh, we were a little, we were a little disappointed when we found out that we had the early bird specials, but uh, it's great that you all showed up and a lot of young faces. And we're going to keep it relevant. It's not just going to be about baby boomers. So actually, let's, let's start. Well, can I say? Can I, I just want to add the reason that. Um, it started at 9.23 was because they were counting on it taking us seven minutes to get up on this stage. That's <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> we go to bed early. <laughs> That's true. It's or time to open up. If I gave the full introduction to both these wonderful people, it would take the entire time. So instead, we arranged their bios on slides that will be rotating throughout the, uh, throughout the session. But let's keep it going from where they talked about, because coincidentally, uh, I've spent my whole life on the vendor side. Marlon spent her whole life at ABC. And Frank spent a great deal of his career at several networks and lately has become a consultant, a, a global worldwide consultant. So let's start with Frank. Which, which side do you like better? I'm going to ask the audience first. The people who are on the client side, so the networks and the television channels that hire the vendors to do the work, would you raise your hands just so I can get an idea? Okay. And so the people who supply the services, the vendors. So it looks like more on the client side. So I go with the client side. Okay. I, I, um, now I, look, I, I spent uh, 17 years at ABC and then another 17 years at NBC and then a couple of things in the middle. So I spent the better part of my lifetime working inside the corporate structure of a giant company. Uh, and especially at NBC at the time, which was owned by GE, and of course the Disney running, running ABC, they're giant corporate cultures. And so you get into that, and uh, you know, rather than scare the hell out of you the, you, know, the first thing I will say is there is a life after all of that, but I can tell you I did go through about a six month depression uh, that, that I went, oh, what? What am I gonna do? Uh, and you know, there's life after that, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Now, Marley, you, you, your first job out of college was at ABC. That's right. And, and your second job has yet to happen. It has yet to happen. <laughs> I've been in the company now for 35 years, and, and people often ask me, you know, you've been there so long, why have you, why have you stayed? And I, the thing is, is that, you know, in this job and the, the very nature of it, and entertainment in general, is that there's a tendency of turnover at the president level in, in entertainment. So the thing is, is that every time I got a new boss, it was like getting a new job. Because you had to adapt. You had to basically understand and learn what their, you know, their, their, their first off, their, their way of doing business. And so the thing is, is that every time this new president came in, it was a new challenge to be able to adapt and think differently, which kept me young. I mean, I had other opportunities to actually go other places, and I was very, very intrigued by it. But again, I, you know, um, I am the ABC viewer. So the thing was is that I was actually in a dream job. I was doing and promoting and marketing shows that I would be watching anyway. So I thought, why not stay in a place where I really love the entertainment that, I, that I'm marketing. But I've always been intrigued by the, by the vendor or the agency side, whatever word you prefer to use, because I feel that there, there was a little bit more of a creative freedom to be able to, you know what I mean, not be so structured, but to be able to, to creatively go with go outside of that kind of branded arena of, of what you had to stick with um, when you were in a kind of a network structure. But I loved it. I loved every minute of it. It's just again as as we come to, to you know talk about about boomers and and and, and being uh, relevant in this space is that you just you just learn that that you're learning things every single day. It, it, it's it's all new every single day. I, no, I think that's the key because look. You, you spend a lifetime uh, becoming good at something. It's like throwing a thousand punches a day. That's why that boxer is better than any other boxer. You, you're, you're learning all this stuff, and while you're learning it, you're also meeting all of these very interesting people along the, the, the way. So the, the, the ride there is, is populated with really cool stuff. So take advantage of all that cool stuff. And, you know, and then when you get to that point, at some time when you have to make a decision as to whether or not hey, you're gonna stay, uh, within a corporate structure, which by the way is really good because they pay you enough money to be creative. I actually think that's a very critical thing, that, that you get paid enough money so you don't have to worry about the gas or the electric or the, you know, the car or the rental or whatever it is, your cat food. You get paid enough money, which is expensive stuff, 
you get paid enough money so that you um, can do your thing. Mostly unencumbered because most creative people have a sort of a built-in encumbrance anyway, so that's part of what makes people creative. I was just going to add to, to the fact that, that the last panel they were talking about job security, and there didn't seem to be a worry about it. And I think that actually helps to delineate certain like boomers and 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 um, millennials. I think the thing is there's a bit of a more of a freedom. Millennials have the ability to. Um, feel freer to, to maybe move from job to job and, and really it's a, it's experience because I, in our conversations before we were talking about this is that in, when I used to see a resume before long, way a long time ago and you would see all of this one person going to various jobs you would think oh my god this person can't retain a job this is this is problematic now when you look at a resume and you see all of this all of these people changing to different jobs, you see it as, as experience. You see it as something that's really a wonderful thing that they're bringing into um, the workplace kind of a different type of expertise. I agree with that completely, but there's a, there, I do, totally. Um, uh, but I, I, I will say, you know, there's a, there's a statement that's been going around, it's, it's in Silicon Valley all the time, and there's no offense to anybody uh, when I say this, but you know that whole it's okay to fail thing? Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. It is not okay to fail. It is not okay to fail. Sure, you'll learn from your failures, but failure is way different than making a mistake, first of all. So, you can make a mistake, fix a mistake. You fail, you're fired. I'm actually, maybe not quite that bad, but in the real world, in the real world, everyone does not win the baseball game. And everyone does not go home with a, with a trophy. Everyone gets the experience, you get paid for the experience, and it's a job. That's regardless of how creative you are if you, or if you own the company. In the end, you can't fail. Do they say when you go into a military operation that failure is okay? No, failure is not an option. I'm not suggesting that what we do is either brain surgery or a you know, military <laughs> operation, but sometimes I'm sure it feels exactly like that. And you learn to deal with that through the experience that you have getting to that point. So what you don't do, is that sound like my father? What you don't do is, I think you know what, we all end up sounding like our parents. What you don't do is make the quantum leap, I think. So you, you come in at a, at a level where you learn from the people who were above you, and when you come in, there's a lot of people. So you learn everything so that when you get to the point of being able to direct a group of people, whether you're directing it, a shoot, or you're directing an apartment, or you're directing it one other person in a project, or you're trying to pull together a pitch, whatever it is, um, you, you, you get to the point where you understand how all of that stuff works together. Uh, and that's really what's important. To circle back to something Marla said, where you talked about how you have a different job every few years because you have a different boss every few years. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed, I know I've noticed, at the beginning of your career, you're the kid, you know, and, and your boss is always 10 or 20 years older than you, and then you get to the point where your bosses are the same age as you, and then you get used to the, the, the interesting phenomenon of working for people who are uh, younger than you. It's, it's amazing. I have this ability to think that whoever I'm working with, I'm the same age as that person, so it always works. But, but the thing is that that's absolutely true is that I now have a person who I report to who's younger than me. Her boss is younger than me. Um, my boss before me was younger than me, so it, it's really interesting. But I never look at it that way. I think in terms of just working together, and again, you learn from, from every single person that comes into that role. And the thing is, is that what you have to do is really kind of and I use the word adapt because adapted is the word that every time I, I, I actually work with people, I've learned to see what, what it is that they want from me or what their expectation is for me. And it, there has to be a willingness to do that. A lot of times people aren't willing to do that because they feel that their way is the only way. And that is so far from, from the way I think. I, I, I know the people here that, that, that is, that's on my team know that this is, for me, it's an open door policy. When they come in, they are teaching me as much as I am teaching them the certain expertise that they bring to it. So I feel that no matter what your age is, who you are, what job you hold, and, and, and at least with my team, is that there is a relevance to you. There's an importance to you. You bring insight at whatever level or whatever age you're at. But the thing is, is that you also can't dismiss the, dismiss the fact that, the, that there is some 
history and some knowledge that I have just from being there that long. I mean, that, that's the thing. I have a, another person who works for me who's older than me, who is my mentor. His name's Stu Brown, who's actually in the Hall of Fame here. <laughs> 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 sit in meetings and what he'll do is we'll all be talking about different things and then he'll bring something up that no one has thought of because there is this history, there is this knowledge of what's been. So the thing is that it's not always throwing the baby out with the bathwater in terms of this knowledge. You take that, you embrace what you you know and carry it on and then you bring in new people who are smarter than you, which I have worked around so many people who are so much smarter than me in all these given areas, especially social. And the thing is, is that I learn from them. I call them in. I ask them the questions. It's almost like what I call reverse mentoring, and which is what, what we do in our company. And, and, and it really is such a benefit. And there's there's so much growth and potential on both sides. So, I, Marla, I think that you start as a marketer from a, the best place you could possibly start. That is this passion and desire and love for the schedule and the television and the industry and the imagery and the content, you know, just you're, you're, you're a consumer of that stuff. So as a marketer, being a good consumer and putting that passion together, that's, I think, what you end up with after you've managed to take all of those steps. I'll give you an example. Um, one of my executive assistants is now the president of NBC Universal Reality Studio. So let me tell you that all you need to do is have the passion and the willingness, and you will get that. I mean, unless you're like an idiot. And then, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, nobody in this room is an idiot, right? I'm just, I know that. You wouldn't be in from Expedia if you were. Uh, but there you go. I'm just going to drop the mic, but they told me not yeah. to. <laughs> we, we were given yeah. strict instructions not to drop the mic. Yes. Well, that would have been a good point. At a certain age, dropping the mic doesn't look like you show up. It looks like you can't hold the mic. <laughs> <laughs> there's such an overlap and there's such a blurring of lines between roles. I think that again, in terms of adapting, you have to understand that you're gonna, there's gonna be expectations for you to take on different things um, that you, know, you normally wouldn't do. You were hired for a job, you basically come in, you do this job. Now with, with technology and social and digital, I mean, for all, for all of us, and I've said this before, is that it's leveled the, the, the playing field, right? In terms of us all learning about this, we're all trying to keep up with everything that's relevant, that's new. We want to be the leaders, not the followers of this. We want to be at the head of the game. So the thing is, is that my, my suggestion was, would be is to embrace that, to take all of that, and, and um, be willing to put on a different hat and, and learn that because it only will help in future when you go to different jobs to become even more relevant and, and more needed and there will never ever be a need of, of not having it. You'll always have a job if you're, there's that willingness to basically learn and um, move forward in your career and, and be willing to accept things that, that you weren't necessarily hired to do. And I love that she, she Marlon had mentioned that expression uh, that, that Technology has leveled the playing field, and it actually made me think of Frank. Because I follow Frank on Twitter, and you all should uh, give us your Twitter handle, uh, Frank. What? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh no, it's at Fredis, F R A D I C. And I was just thinking about what I was saying. I thought of you was because following you, you're always on the cutting edge of new stuff, and I know that I can always rely on hearing about stuff from you. And I was just wondering, is that something you, oh, did you always have a passion for new stuff and gadgets, or is that Absolutely. something that's recently? Absolutely. You know how they say that, that, that when you know, you're born a certain way and that when you leave, you're pretty much the same person you were when you were born. So, um, you know, it, that sort of thing is happening right now. So a, a, a person entering this industry right now, for the most part, if, especially if you're one of the creative people, you've had the opportunity to write, produce, direct, edit, shoot do the music, you know, you're all John Carpenter. Um, and that's that's exactly what the boomers did years ago when we did that. We made sure that we could write, produce, direct, edit, shoot. We even had to process the film. Rockets, honest the guy. We had to process the film. Then we had to carry the film back to the edit room. Oh my God, we were barefoot. We were climbing up these hills. <laughs> and, uh, and, we carried the film back and we cut the film and, and you know, you, it, it comes down to um, being able to be a good storyteller. 
um, especially in our business as marketers. Look, the, the whole idea of short form content that is brand new is that lives not on the network is the single, one of the single biggest realities, including streaming. Uh, and streaming takes advantage of that kind of content integration. Um, that's what we do in a short form, and who tells short form stories better than promo people? Excuse me, nobody. Absolutely nobody, because every single day you're cutting a 30 that tells the entire story of the next show coming up, it's probably better than that show. It better be, because more people will see that spot than will see that show. You know that, and you put that spot in a couple of hits, and boom, there's the power of television. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's an important thing. That's it. Yeah. Let's talk about one of the real challenges of, of being a little bit older. Uh, there, there are advantages. Some of, some of my best ideas come when I wake up at 3 in the morning to go to the bathroom. <laughs> but uh, the, the challenge is perception. It's, it's not just what you can do, but what people think you can do. And I know I'm, I'm going through something this week because usually I come to Promax with a couple of members of my team and they're a lot younger and I feel like if I go to a meeting with them, they kind of average me out, you know. But because they're millennials, one of them told me they wanted to spend three months in Europe this summer and one said they wanted to spend three months in Alaska, so I'm here alone. And, and I feel a little naked because um, you go into a meeting and you're pitching to people who are 20 years younger than you and you talk about stuff that's really aimed at a young audience and you worry, are they looking at me and wondering, can he deliver that? And I'm wondering, could, could you go to pitch meetings with showrunners who I'm sure are quite young and, and, and the stuff you're involved with? You're, how do you deal with that perception or do you deal with it and just let them deal with it themselves? Well, what's so interesting, when we start to launch a show, what we do is we have a, a we call a producer's meeting. And so what happens is marketing uh, rallies all of these different teams together, whether it's Synergy and um, it's affiliate marketing, it's photo, it's, it's, it's all these groups of people that come into one room to listen to the vision of what the producers have in mind for the show and the season. So we go around the room, and I, I, you know, and it's a tremendous amount of people in the room, and the, the producers are always impressed because it looks like, oh my God, these people are, are all going to work on my show. And first season producers are always wonderful because they're, they're willing to have their talent do anything and everything, and then the second season, nothing. <laughs> but, um, the but, second season, that the guy gets a hit show. That's right. Boy, that's, just that's right. So what happens is, is we go around the room, and I'm sure that when they see me, they think like, oh my God, she's old. But anyway, and how they how she to do my social media what's all that about but then as we go around the room you know you see all of these fresh young faces and I think the thing is that there's a comfort level in knowing and like I said before is that you know I don't do this alone I do it with a group of tremendously <clears throat> excuse me smart people who know their stuff that have a certain expertise in that particular area so when we go across you know around the room you see someone saying his name and saying I oversee social media, or I oversee this, and then there's like a, there's a light that comes out the producer's faces and basically, ah, oh, okay, these are the people that are going to be working on. And you know, I don't pretend to basically tell them to come to me for everything. I I say we have a social team, we have a synergy team, we have a franchise team, so that they see these people. And I always make sure that I bring them into the forefront. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to be the spokesman. For my team, unless you know, I'm, I'm asked to. But the thing is, I want everybody else to shine, and I want everybody else to know that these people, these, these, this future is here, and they're going to be working for you. So I, I don't find it as much. I mean, I think there's times where producers feel that they can do their own thing. You know, what I mean, if they're younger, um, in particular, because who doesn't know social media? Who doesn't know digital? Because we're all on it. But again, when you're talking about marketing strategy, and you're talking about that, that there is a campaign that plays into every, you know. Know, touch point of what we're doing, then it does become an expertise that we as, as a marketing team need to, need to hold and control, where sometimes producers want to take that and run with it on their own without any kind of strategy uh, in place. So I think the thing is that it's a lot, there's a lot of conversation that goes on about, about that. I think Frank might have something. Yeah, I do want to say something because here's, here's the problem. Shoot, go back a slide. Can you go back a slide? If you can't go back a slide. Did you see those shows that, that Marla launched? Those are the, some of the absolutely deserves a huge round of applause. Look, 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 look at that list. Oh my God. Um, aside from that, the comedies. Uh, aside from that, that's, first of all, that's just the comedies, but because Marla does that, does it all, and has been doing it for a long time. And so that just shows that 
there's no way you stay in that position without understanding how the new technology impacts the media plan. There is absolutely no way, and there's no doubt that in today, modern day media plans, because you really absolutely just can't launch a show on your own network. You have to do a, a, a you have to do an earned media, you have to do a paid media, you have to make sure that you that you blanket all of these other touch points that you and they all cost money. So uh, so you have to figure all of that into the budget of how you create that media plan for whatever it is that project is. But um, and you can't do that. In a vacuum, even if you have experts, you cannot do that in a vacuum. So here's the, here's a critical thing to make sure that you understand, is that um, it's, if it's new and it's out there and it can affect how you communicate with people, then you should attempt to, to use it and work with it and understand it. So in my in, in my experience so far in this on this planet, um, it's it's about notifications and messaging uh, more than it is about even email, and and so an understanding of how notifications and messaging can can work in the social sphere and then figure out a layer of how you put imagery into it so it could be tape and it could be a short thing it could be a clip it could be video it could be whatever it is you learn how to do that and you learn how to create it as, as a marketing tool which doesn't feel like marketing it has to feel like content but you know you're smart you'll, you'll figure this out um, you'll figure this out and then you'll come back and you'll say to us hey look we figured this out and then, you know, if you figured it out, we'll absolutely use it. Good example, must see TV. I'm not saying anymore. <laughs> but, you know, I think to you, I'm sorry, Seth, but I think to your point, I think one example, and I'm not telling any of you anything new, is that you go to a restaurant, you see a family of four, they're all on their phones, right? I mean, the thing is that nobody's talking to each other. You take that, just observing, you go back to the workplace and you say, look at, I see a campaign that potentially, what if we did all of it, what if, and hypothetically, what if we spent all our money just on mobile? Let's just say, we spent all our money on mobile and we direct our attention to that and don't put any other money towards it. Again, just thinking out of, you know, out of the box. So what I did is I gathered a team together and again, a very young team, uh, along with the person that was running our social media, social digital media, and then uh, the person who oversees our, our daytime marketing. And then I had them rally a, a bunch of people within the group, younger people, to sit down and create, dare I say the word, task force, that basically talks about to each other, they talk to each other and say, what would this, ha how, what would it be like? How, how would you talk to these people on mobile? How, what would you do? How would we, how would we market to them? Again, just, sitting around taking the expertise of all of these people. Did you do it? We did, we're doing it. You're we're, doing we're it. We're actually doing it right so now. So the entire media I mean, we're not, is... we're not doing, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're actually creating this task force to oh, see, I see. What, it, what it would entail yeah. that if we decided to so do I, that. So I, 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 will, I will throw my head into the ring and be a little bit of a, because I'd love to do the same. It, before you do Even that, if I don't believe it, Frank, before you do that, uh, I noticed it's on zero. Are, are we, uh, do, do we need to wrap up or? Nobody's waving it. Nobody's paying attention. I, so I was going to say, are we out of time? But somebody will come up and like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Four, four minutes. minutes. We have four minutes. Oh, great. Right. So keep going. Um, I, I just think that um, uh, that it's it, it can't it can't work. Uh, it can't work because you are the the ABC Television Network, and you represent this this. I don't care what anyone says. It's still only three major networks. Okay, Fox. It's, it's, it's a network. But there's really only three major networks. I'm telling you, CNN is a network, kind of global, but it's you know it's a network. There's there's ABC, NBC, and CBS. Think think about it any way you want to. I don't care. Um, it, so so and they reach 99 percent of the country combined, and that is powerful. You you can have one billion people on Facebook, but that you know, what are you going to get? 10 million to watch your cat with a bowl? I mean, okay, that's great. What are those 10 million going to walk away with? This is the issue that we are struggling with as television people, uh, marketing broad and general audience. Um, is is that how does is is are we getting back a, a real viewability and a digital ROI in marketing in a space that looks like as it does has a zillion numbers? But what are the what are, what is the effect of that eyeball? We uh, we just don't know that yet. I, and I think that we're we all think we know that we have we have our task force and most of them the research that are out there trying to create this total audience measurement indicator index, whatever you want to call it, which includes uh, you know. The, the reach and frequency of, of, a, of any kind of digital placement. Um, but in the end, uh, is, is reach and frequency or impressions enough? I'm not sure. But so how do you, 
how do you um, uh, combat that? You combat that by having a multivariate, ma many platform media plan uh, that reaches every target because your research will tell you what your target is, so you'll know where to place it. So don't put it in the New York Times, put it in, I don't know, the Washington Post. By the end of it. Or, you know, put the billboard at 50th and 7th. Or, uh, you know, whatever it is, whether it's, yeah, we need radio in the top 10 markets. Well, we own the top 10 markets, so that's really easy. Um, so, you know, it's that's what it that's what it is, and that creative that whoever comes up with the spark has to, you know, cut across all the platforms. And, and all I would say is that it's an exploration. It's really not saying that we're going to do that, but what it's going to do is going to actually bring and bubble up ideas that will show how we treat mobile differently. Now, again, maybe not take everything and put it on there, but again, what it does, it opens up their minds to different ideas that could that might not come out if you said, okay, we're only putting 10% to, to mobile. We're only going to put 20%. But what if we did all this so that... You know what, any idea is possible. Right. So that's really the goal is to do that. But I agree with you. I think the thing is is that you have, you have to have a campaign that, that covers a lot like of other... You know more about absolutely. mobile's efficacy once that's, you get into the, and that's to the this goal. point. Yeah. That's the goal is that you want that. But I mean, again, I know we don't have very much time. All I would say, just taking away, is that, again, embrace this time. It's an exciting, exciting time. We're always learning. I'm continuing to learn. You're continuing to learn. Put on those hats. Wear on listen to people I mean listening also is another great a great um, talent that, that people should have because when you listen you know what people want you know what people need and the thing is is that you take that and you run with that and use it to your you know for your own good and if you happen to be in London on November 3rd um, uh, we're going to be uh, doing the Promax UK conference we call it it's not another punking conference uh, and um, it's really going to be cool. So uh, if you happen to be in London on November 3rd, uh, we're going to blow it out with something completely different. You'll start reading about it soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And thank you, Marla. Thank you. Thank you all for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. Let Promax know that it didn't. Maybe next year, this, this will be the promo. Next year, we'll come back. We'll be a year older and smarter, so it's a little bit even better. And we'll have them, graphics. We'll have graphics. A full 45 minutes of Lewis and his vendors versus clients, and the grass is greener. We'll Thank walkers. you all for coming out. Have a great day and a great conference.